here tonight at Christ is King Church. If we can make our way into our seats, we're going to get started. We're going to start with uh, praise and worship and get right into the word. But first, let's start with prayer. Lord God, we thank you, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this place, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, that as we uh, study this series about the end times, Father God, you'll just give us your ears to hear your voice, Father. We praise you and we give you all the glory. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
sacrifices of praise to you. For you are the Lord of all. Yes, you are. You are the Lord of all. How great you are. God above the heavens and Lord of all the earth. How great you are. Mighty God of healing, salvation and strength. How great. salvation we honor you we bring sacrifices of praise to you you are the lord
wrapped up lowly. You wrapped the lowly in royalty. I will lay my crowns and I will lay. surrender my everything here I surrender my every I will lay my crowns down and I will lay my crowns down at your feet you are holy holy and I will give my life as an offering
is Lord who rules. Holy are you, Lord God. Holy are you.
read a passage while we're in this time of worship, and then I'd like to lead us in a prayer. Isaiah chapter 6, it's a passage many of us are familiar with. Isaiah has a vision of the holiness of God. Isaiah 6 verse 1, it says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. Another translation says, For I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. This is an amazing passage. Isaiah at the time was one of, if not the most righteous person in Israel. But when he got a vision of the Lord, he realized who he was in the sight of a holy God. And he said that his, his mouth was unclean. He was a man of unclean lips. He was broken. He was undone because of who he was, but also because of who God was. In this moment, he, he recognized, like he says later in this book, that his righteousness was as filthy rags, and it brought him to utter repentance and what's amazing here is the seraphim don't leave him in this spot of brokenness they don't say yeah that's right you you you're nothing in the sight of God there's no hope for you be gone no the the seraphim comes down and they cleanse his lips and it says that his guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for And I know that's all of us tonight. I know that we have all experienced that. We've called on the name of of Christ and he has saved us. But I wanna pray tonight that that wouldn't be, and hopefully it hasn't been a one-time thing for us, but that we would have a continued revelation of the holiness of God and a continued brokenness over our sin and then also experience that continued healing that Christ offers us through his blood. 
So if you could just join together with me as I pray this. And as I'm praying too, if, if the Lord puts someone on your heart that you know they have yet to be in this state that Isaiah was in of brokenness before God, go ahead and lift them up in faith as well, trusting that the Spirit would open their eyes and bring, this to the, bring them to this place of repentance. Father, we thank you that you are a holy God. Lord, you were holy thousands of years ago when Isaiah had this vision. You were holy eons before that in all eternity. God, you are holy now and you will be holy forever. Father, I thank you that even in your holiness, you reached down in love and sent Christ to die for us, to, to reconcile us back to you because you are a holy God, but you're also a loving God. You're a merciful God. You're a gracious God. Father, I pray that we would never lose sight of your holiness. Lord, that we would, like Isaiah, be broken over our sin, not just the first time when we asked you into our heart or when we repented of the first time, the first time, Lord, but that we would daily be broken over our sin, but in that brokenness, realize the sweetness of your forgiveness, the sweetness of your son, the beauty of the cross, the beauty of what Christ did for us, and that we would experience healing. Like Paul says, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Yes, we are broken over our sin, but we also rejoice of what Christ has done for us, that we don't have to be living a life of shame and misery, but that we can cling to the cross. Lord, as you, you touch our lips, you touch our bodies, you touch our mind, you touch our hearts, you touch our thoughts, that we would have pure thoughts towards you, God. Lord, for those that we know who are lost, Lord, who have yet to be undone, who have yet to be broken, Father, that by your Holy Spirit, you would work in their hearts. Lord, that you would give eyes to the blind, that you would open their hearts to receive from you, to, to get a taste of your holiness and to get a taste of redemption that comes with, this, with the broken and contrite heart. We thank you for this, Lord. Thank you for meeting us here tonight. Thank you that your presence with us. With us. Thank you that we get to meet with Christ tonight. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, um, you can go ahead and greet a few people, and then we will get to the word shortly. Thank you for worshiping with us this evening. All right, what a great group of saints we have here tonight. Uh, before we get to the word, I do want to share just a couple of announcements. And the first is, if tonight's your first time here with us, thanks for coming to church on Sunday night and being with us. And if it is your first time here, be sure to say hello to somebody 
on your way out. Don't just sneak in here and escape without someone saying hi to you. I would love to meet you if it's your first time. So, uh, Also, I did want to mention our VIP bus tour that's happening um, two weeks from yesterday. If, if you're wanting to go, please sign up soon so we, we have an idea of who all is, is coming. Uh, seating's limited, and so if you're wanting to go, sign up for that. Uh, Yoli Huron will be in the lobby after with a clipboard to help you get signed up for that. And that's really the only main, main thing I wanted to announce. So let's welcome up Pastor Matt to give us part, this is part three, right? Part three of 10 or so-ish teachings on the last days. Uh, definitely are, am going to shoot to keep this to 10, and uh, that's, that's the goal. Um, this afternoon around... Um, five-ish when I was printing off my notes for tonight and the printer spit out nine pages. I've, I started to question my sanity and wondering if I've, what, what I've gotten us into uh, by trying to do this series. And, um, but you can't put the toothpaste back in the tooth, back in the tube. So here we go. We're just, we, we're, in, we're in it now. We're going to we're going to keep, keep plugging along here. If this is your first night in this series, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we've, there's been two other weeks where we've laid a, a, a bit of a foundation that we're going to be building on this evening. Uh, let me give you just a bit of a, a quick recap. We are going to be in Matthew 24 again. So if you have your Bibles, go to Matthew 24. I want to say that next week we are going to be... Uh, taking a break from the series. It's going to be Easter Sunday. We're going to be celebrating baptism on Sunday evening. It's going to be a wonderful time of baptism. So we're going to take a break from the series for next Sunday. And then the following Sunday, we're getting into the book of Revelation. We'll, we'll be going to Revelation. And everyone goes, ooh. Ah. Okay, so Revelation will not be not next Sunday, but the following Sunday. So, we're studying eschatology. What is eschatology? It's the study of the last things. And it's from this Greek word eschatos and logos, the, the study of the last things, the things at the end. And we're calling our series The Last Days. Now, I, I, I do want to say last week, um, last week, th I'm endeavoring for this to be a teaching series so I'm endeavoring to teach and not preach, but I'm a preacher, and so it's hard for me to not preach. I'm trying to teach, but sometimes I just get fired up. I get fired up all the time, and so, um, but please, please don't mistake, if, if I happen to stumble and begin to preach, please don't mistake my exuberant tone for um, thinking, thinking that I don't see merit in the other views of eschatology. Um, I have a high and great deal of respect for, for people who hold to different views than me, a very high view. And I quote them often, even in my sermons. And so this eschatology is not something that we divide over. It, it should not be. And it should be something that uh, we study, that enriches our Christian walk in life, but that doesn't bring division to our church. And I don't believe that it's going to bring division here as well. I also want to say that it's taken me nearly, it was nearly 25 years ago that I went to my, my Bible school class on Bible prophecy and was introduced to these other views of eschatology. Growing up, I, I predominantly only heard one view, that premillennial dispensational view. And then I got to Bible school and I learned there was other views. And that was nearly 25 years ago at this point. And so I'm not anticipating you in 10 weeks to digest what I've studied in 25 years. That's not what I'm expecting. Uh, but I do think that 
For some of you, this is going to be something that piques your interest and that you will devote personal study time to. And I believe it will enrich your walk with the Lord as you endeavor to do that. But even with that, I know that there's going to be many of you who do not end up seeing things the way that I have come to see them. And that is okay. That is okay. I've had a few people, you know, asking me if I don't, if I don't end up seeing things the way you do, is there still a place for me at this church? And yes, absolutely. Because you're in good, you'll be in good company. In fact, you'll be where I was a few years ago. So yes, there's going to be a place for you in this church. And I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to move everybody uh, to my position, but I am trying to broaden our understanding of these different views. And so again, I hold great respect. Charles Spurgeon, somebody I quote often in my sermons, he was pre-millennial. He had a view of the millennium that is different than mine. I still hold him up. If, if I could be one-tenth of the preacher that Charles Spurgeon wants, I would die a happy man. So I, I have great respect for people who hold other views, and I just want to underscore that at the beginning tonight in case I slip and fall and start preaching uh, when we get into the Bible. Uh, so, and, but, but here's the thing. I can, I can respect someone and their views, and I can respect why they would hold those views, but I can still disagree with them, right? I can understand why someone would hold to that as... This afternoon, I was reading Charles Spurgeon's commentary on Matthew 24, and I was seeing his perspective, and I can understand why he, why he lands where he lands, even though I don't see that view that way. Even though I would reject that view, it doesn't lower him in my view at all. It doesn't lower my estimation or respect for him. And this is a little bit of a, an issue with the day and age in which we live. Because we live in a culture that says, unless you accept everything about me, then you are rejecting me. And as Christians, we know that's not the way things are. We know that there are certain things that we would accept about some people and certain things that we would not. As Christians, we're more mature than that. As Christians, we know that to disagree with somebody on some point is not rejecting them as a person. And so this calls on us to be mature in our thinking. And again, this underscores a little bit why most pastors won't even touch this subject because they don't want to bring division and, and they don't want people to start arguing about this stuff and it's easier for them just not to deal with it at all. And I know that as we move through this, it's going to be stretching us a little bit, but I believe that we are a mature congregation that will be enriched by studying eschatology and not be divided by it. And so this is simply something we're not going to divide over. Because in the scripture, we're not called to unite around our eschatology views. We're called to unite around Christ and the gospel. That's, that's what unites us. And so if we're looking to build unity around secondary things, oftentimes we're not going to share unity at all. In fact, we will end up being divided. We need to keep the main thing the main thing. And I hope that we're able to do that. And I do want to say, we are actually all united on the big picture of eschatology. We're all united on this. And I shared it with you last week. Jesus wins. Amen? Amen. Anybody here disagree with that tonight? Jesus wins. All Christians for all time have believed this. And this is what we believe. This is what we are united on. This is the gospel. Jesus wins. We are all united on the big... Here, I'm preaching again. We're all united on the big... I need to take like Benadryl or dope, uh, what Dramamine or something to, to be able to teach. But We're all united on the big picture of eschatology. And you say, what's the official position of, of Christ is King Church on eschatology? This is it. Jesus wins. This is it. Christ is King. Jesus wins. And hear this, we are all on the same train, all of us. And that train that we are on, the destination it is headed to is this destination where Jesus wins. We're all headed in that direction. We are all on the same train. 
what we might have different views on is the scenery we think we're going to experience on the way to this destination. We might think we'll see a few different things in, on the scenic route along that way, but we are all on the same train, we are all unified on this, and we are all headed to the same destination. Amen. That's because we share these constants in uh, common. And I've shared these before, but we, these are the constants of eschatology. Christ is coming a second time to this earth, physically, visibly. That when he comes, there's going to be judgments on nations and peoples and, and believers and unbelievers. That there's two destinations for every human soul, heaven or hell. That, that, that where we end up is not based on our own good works and merit, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news, those who have been saved and transformed by Jesus will be ushered into heaven. Those who have rejected Christ and the gospel will be in hell. Everyone will be resurrected, not just the righteous, but also the unrighteous. Some to eternal life, others to damnation. Christ is the ultimate judge of all. There will be a new or renewed heavens and earth. Our bodies will be transformed and we will enter into eternal bliss and glory. We are united on this. Amen. There are variables. I've shared these with you. I want to remind you of them again. The chronology of events. What happens between here and there. That's where Christians start having conversations. Literal interpretation or symbolic interpretation. We're going to see that tonight. Relationship between Israel and the church. What is that and what does that look like? Christians have conversations about that. And then the interpretive method of Revelation and the Olivet Discourse. Now, the next slide has a lot of words on it. Don't freak out, okay? But here are the interpretive methods. Historicism, futurism, preterism, idealism, eclecticism. We've looked at these each week. But just briefly, this is the way that people read the book of Revelation and then apply this interpretation method also to Matthew 24, which we're in tonight. Historicism says that Revelation chapter 6 starts at the beginning of the church age and it runs all the way through the end of the book of Revelation in a chronological order throughout the church age. So the historicist will point to Revelation chapter 17 and say, here we are, this is where we are right here, right now. The futurist looks at all of Revelation 6 to the end of Revelation and says, none of it has started. That's all in our future. The preterist says, looks at Revelation in Matthew 24 and says, that is in the past. It happened in the past. It was fulfilled in the first century. The idealist is similar to the historicist, but doesn't hold to a particular timeline. Therefore, it, it, history can repeat in cycles. And that's the idealist view. And then there's the eclectic view that just says, I'll take a little bit of all of that, please. Thank you very much. And they just kind of mix and match as they go along. This, this right here, this is eschatology. This is it. This determines your view, how you interpret the books. Eschatology is not timelines. Eschatology uh, is not about who you think the Antichrist is or the beast or what does 666 mean or the huge grasshoppers with scorpion tails or the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I know when people start talking about revelation and eschatology, they, they want to get to that. That's the juicy stuff. Give me the juicy stuff. Truly, this is eschatology right here. How you interpret those things is what will determine your eschatology. Eschatology is all about interpretation method. What do you take literally and what do you take symbolically? This is the continental divide of eschatology. You know the continental divide, the Rocky Mountains, right? There's a point on the Rocky Mountains where if rain falls on this side of the Rocky Mountains, all of that rain ends up and flows into the Pacific Ocean. And if rain falls on the other side, all of that precipitation, all of that water flows through all those rivers out to the Gulf Coast or to the Atlantic Ocean. That's the continental divide. And this here is the continental divide of eschatology. How do you interpret what you read? 
What do you take literally and what do you take symbolically? That is what leads people down different paths to different, finally, these views of eschatology. That's it. These four views are determined by the way you read those books and how you either take things literally or symbolically. And I will say this, you can't take it all literally. And I'll show you that tonight. Um, there's people who just say, we are literalists and we take everything literally. And, and those who take things symbolically or allegorically, uh, you are not uh, being faithful to the text because you're interpreting things in a symbolic and allegorical way. Hear me in this. Everybody makes decisions on this. Every camp takes something symbolically and some things literally and what you choose to do that determines what path you go down. Now last week I shared with you that the view that I lean towards is the preterist interpretation method which sees the bulk of these uh, prophetic words though they were in the future to when Jesus and John spoke them they are now in our past, having been mostly fulfilled in the first century. And so that leads me to a post-millennial or optimistic view of the future. Now, I shared with you, I recognize that is a minority position in the church today. The vast majority of the church today, and probably even in our church, would be dispensational premillennial. And that's not surprising to me at all, because that is where most people are at today. But I will say that though the position I hold is in the minority in contemporary circles, it has not historically been the minority, but uh, for much of church history was the majority position. Now I'm sharing with you up front what position I hold and which direction I lean. And I'm, I'm doing this because I'm not going to pretend to be unbiased. Because if I was up here pretending to be unbiased, you know what that would be? That would be deception. That would be a lie. I am biased. And so the, the best way I know how to be honest is to share with you my bias. Th this is the way that I lean. We all have our biases. And if I claim to be unbiased, I would be lying. And in fact, the claim to be unbiased is in itself a bias. So it's an inescapable reality. And, and just as a side note, this is why we all hate the news. Because they claim to be what? Unbiased. They claim to be neutral. And are they? Absolutely not. We know they all have a bent. We know Fox News is conservative. We know CNN and and, you know, fake news, MSNBC. We know they're all liberal. We know their biases. They know we know their biases. <laughs> and yet they still pre pretend to be unbiased and neutral. So I'm not, going to, I'm not going to do that. I respect you too much to do that. I'm not going to pretend to be unbiased, but I'm going to strive for honesty. And so I've laid out my bias. I've put it on the table. I'm telling you ahead of time what my perspective is so that you can take that into account as we walk through this series together. And I'm committing to be honest. And I'm committing to be fair. And what I mean by that is when I represent the other positions to the best of my ability, I'm going to tell you what they believe faithfully, give you their interpretation. Now, I, if I believed that, I would be in that camp. But I'm, I'm not in that camp, so I'm not going to pretend to be in that camp. But what I will do is when I give you the other interpretations of historic pre-mill or dispensational pre-mill or ah-mill, then I will, to the best of my ability, faithfully tell you what they believe. I'm not going to build straw man arguments or misrepresent their positions. Does that make sense? Okay. Last week, this is the last slide. Sli slad. This is the last slide on our recap, but I shared with you what, what I think are the foundational texts, the, or they, they are the foundational texts that I hold to for eschatology. And they aren't in Revelation. And Revelation, the reason they're not, Revelation is not a foundational book. By definition, it's all the way at the very end. 
the revelation is not foundational. Genesis is foundational. Okay. Revelation builds on everything that comes before it. It's the very last of the book to be written. It draws on so much stuff from, from the, the whole rest of the Bible that, that preceded it, especially the, the prophetic writings of the apocalyptic literature of the Old Testament. And so, again, the foundational texts that I hold to that, that lead me to, to have an optimistic view of the future is simply Jesus' words here where he says he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it and that the mission of the church is to go and get the nations for Christ. And so that, that to me is enough, these clear words of Jesus, to, to hope for and to look for the Great Commission to be fulfilled in a very real, tangible, and dramatic way. Because I believe that God is sovereign. And I think we would all agree on that as well. We, we, we teach that here at the church. That the sovereignty of God, that, that he rules and reigns over all things. And that what God wants to happen, happens. So we can all agree that, that no matter what position we hold to, in the end of the day, it, it really matters what position he holds to. Because that's the one that's going to end up coming to pass. And we all agree on that. And a hearty amen to that. God is in control. God is in charge. Not the devil. Not the Antichrist. God is the one who is sovereign. Now, now you need to know, not all Christians believe this. I got into a wonderful conversation with another pastor recently about this. And we... Um, Still love each other, but uh, it was a, uh, let's just say it was frothy. It, it got animated. It, we, 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 we were working through, what, what do you mean, what do you mean, what do you mean? And, and so, not all Christians believe in the sovereignty of God. Many Christians believe that God has made man sovereign. And that it is the free will of man that's going to determine the future, not the sovereign will of God. I, I know that sounds shocking because, of, because we all heartily amen, yes, that God is sovereign. And so we can agree, though, I believe we all agree that what God wants to have happen is going to happen. And, and as I've just poured myself into Scripture I've, I've come away with the belief that what God wants to have happen is for the nations to be converted and for the nations to be discipled and for the gospel to, to go out and to penetrate every area of life. That's what I've, I've taken away to believe that God is what God wants to happen. And that leads me to have an optimistic perspective on the future and, and for the church. Because I believe he's promised the church will be victorious. And I believe he gave the mission to the church of, of going and getting the nations for Christ. I'm trying to dial it back because I'm not, trying not to preach. Just, uh. But I believe that God is saving the world. He's redeeming the world. He's restoring the world. And so last week we got into Matthew chapter 24. I invite you to uh, open with me now and go there. Because I think many of you would say, okay, yeah, I, I, see how, I see how you could think that these verses say that the church will be victorious and the nations will be discipled and the gospel will cover the earth. I, I see how you could get that from these verses, but pastor, doesn't Matthew 24, doesn't the book of Revelation talk about things getting worse and worse? And what about the great tribulation? Isn't that in the future? How can we be hopeful for the future when the apostles and Jesus all warn that the future is not going to be bright but bleak? Which leads us to Matthew 24. We started uh, looking at this last week, and I didn't take time last week to read it, but I want to take time to read it uh, this week. I don't want to just be jumping in and out of it. I really want to take the time to read it this evening. 
And I do hope that you have your Bible because we are going to be in the text a lot tonight. And I reminded you of the context last week where Jesus had pronounced in Matthew 23 the seven woes upon the scribes and the Pharisees, that whole religious system. He was going to bring judgment upon it. In verse 35 of 23, he says, On you is going to come the judgment for all the righteous blood shed on the earth from Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Verse 36, Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those that are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In chapter 24, I'll just pronounced all these judgments coming upon this generation. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be one stone left upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? Now last week, the the point that I pressed home was that from this point on, what Jesus is answering is the answer to the judgment that he had pronounced upon Jerusalem and the temple. That he's telling them when the temple, these are the signs of the temple being destroyed. I know it says the close of the age. You have to understand they were living in the Jewish age. That, that age was coming to an end. The book of Hebrews talks about that over and over again, that it's fading away, it's passing away. That whole system, the sacrifices, the, the rituals, all of that is being fulfilled in Christ. So the end of the age here is not the end of the space-time continuum as I take it, or the end of, 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 of life on earth, but the end, the close of that Jewish age. And so from here on, I, the way I interpret this is that he's pronouncing this judgment upon Jerusalem. Now, I want to read this section, and then we'll come back and we'll walk through it, and I'll share with you how I interpret these statements, and I'll share with you some of the other views and how they interpret them as well. So Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of lawlessness, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, parentheses, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his home. Let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for the women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be 
saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there is the Christ, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man." Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angel with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So one interpretation of the passage I just read you, this is the one that Charles Spurgeon held to, was that in answering this question, Jesus is weaving in and out of topics. Here a little bit he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Here he's talking about his future return and second return to the earth. And, and he's interweaving and, and some things apply to both and, and some things only apply to one or to the other. And that Jesus is, in answering this question, uh, weaving in and out. And, and it's up to us to put it together. What was he talking about that applied to A.D. 70 when the temple was destroyed by the Roman army? And what does apply to the second coming of Christ? That was the view that Charles Spurgeon held to. For the dispensational perspective, which is, the, again, the view that is the most popular today, this is an easy passage to explain. Simply, none of this has happened. It's all in the future. That, that truly is the dispensational perspective. Th- this is... When we look and we see, we walk outside tomorrow morning, is the sun still shining? Is the moon still there? Have the stars fallen from the sky? Nope, that hasn't happened yet, so none of this has taken place. This is in the future, because they hold to a very literal interpretation of the sun stopping to shine, the stars falling from the sky. And so because of this, uh, this... Uh, what I consider to be hyperliteralism uh, forces a future view that produces a lot of end times speculation. A lot of speculation about what could be in the future or, or could be coming in the future. And this speculation, uh, and if you're good at marketing, this speculation can turn into a lot of book sales. And so the tribulation sells. You want to start talking about the future and the great tribulation and, and I just saw six signs that tell us we're right on the verge of the Antichrist emerging and there's these blood moons and the rapture's happening next year. You start talking like that, you, you could start selling books. There's an insatiable hunger for that kind of stuff and maybe that's what you thought this series was going to be. Maybe that's why only half of you are left. The rapture... All, everyone who believed in the rapture was raptured, and now it's just, um, that was a joke. That was a joke. Golly, man, it's getting hot up here. <laughs> but it leads to a lot of speculation. Um, famously, there was an author named Edgar Wisenat. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he published a book uh, that was published in the late 80s, and the book came out in at the beginning of 1988 and it was called 88 reasons 
why the rapture will happen in 1988. And his book, in one year, sold 4.5 million copies. That's before the internet. One, uh, 4.5 million copies. Now, and, and he famously said, why isn't that famously said, only if the Bible is in error am I wrong. That's quite a statement. Well, I don't know if you remember 1989. That rolled around. And the rapture didn't happen in 1988. And Wisenat published another book. 89 reasons why the rapture will happen in 89. That one didn't sell quite as well. Nor did his later titles that predicted the rapture in 1993 and again in 1994. You may be familiar with Hal Lindsey. He wrote the book, The Late Great Planet Earth. The, the latest numbers I could find on this, um, again, th this interprets this text and it applies it in fictional kind of story. But in 1999... That was the latest book sales I could find for numbers on this. Late Great Planet Earth had sold 35 million copies and had been translated into more than 50 languages. Some of you may be familiar with the Left Behind book series. It's a fictional um, telling of the future according to a futurist view of Matthew 24 and Revelation. Close to 80 million copies of the Left Behind series. So the, the vast majority of the reason why most Christians hold to these views is not because they've sat under a pastor exegeting, uh, bringing out the truth of a text, is because there's been a pop culture phenomenon around the rapture and the mark of the beast and the antichrist because this stuff sells. It's sensational. Now, remember that I said no view can take everything literally. So the dispensational futurist view of Matthew 24, they would, they, would, they would stand and say, we take this literally. That's why we know it hasn't happened yet. We hold to a literal interpretation. But they don't take everything literally. The one verse they take symbolically is verse 34, where Jesus says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. They reinterpret this generation to mean that generation. That future generation that starts after the rapture and then the great tribulation starts when Jesus here says this generation, they reinterpret it symbolically to mean that generation. And that's what I mean by saying that not every, that, that every view t has to decide what am I viewing symbolically, what am I taking as normal language. And so in my, in my view, this completely flips the meaning of the text. It, it really does. H how you interpret Matthew 24, 34. It, 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 it is that dividing line. It is that continental divide. I, in fact, take the opposite view that when Jesus said this generation, he literally meant the generation that he was living in, the, the people he was talking to, the, the people that would crucify him and that they would receive the judgment for that sin. It's the other language that I think is more symbolic. But you can't have it both ways. You, you, you have to make a decision. Is it going to be this generation or is it going to be that generation? Now, if I can do it without stepping on too many toes, let me share with you what I think is the compelling evidence that Jesus literally meant his generation. And it's because by the time you get to Matthew 24, 
Jesus has already used that term seven times speaking about his generation. So when he comes, when Matthew here is, is writing this down, he's, he's already used this term speaking of this generation seven times in Matthew's gospel. And every time we see them in Matthew's gospel, they don't, it, this generation never applies to a future generation. So I want to put these up here quickly. I don't have time to go in and, and look at all of the context of all of them. But I'll put all of them up here on the screen at once. You could pull out that little camera in your pocket and snap it. And you can look at the context of them later. But Jesus, throughout Matthew 24, he's been talking about his generation, this generation. What can I compare this generation to? He calls them an evil and adulterous generation on multiple occasions. He says the queen of the south on the last day will rise up in judgment against this generation and condemn it. Because she was enamored with Solomon. Jesus says something greater than Solomon is here. He calls the generation again this evil generation. Again, evil and adulterous generation. Oh, faithless and twisted generation. Then we saw here at the end of Matthew 23, right on the heels of this, that all of these things will come upon this generation. Speaking just so abundantly clear in Matthew 23 about the destruction of the temple. And then here we have it in Matthew 24. And so to be, in my, in my view, to be consistent... He's everywhere Jesus uses this phrase, he is talking about the people who are alive right then and there. Never once in any of these that came before was he talking about people 2,000 years in the future. To me, that's, to me I find that compelling. I, I know that um, others do not, and, and that's okay. But this is that continental divide. You, you can... You can Slice a line down eschatology on how you interpret this verse. Matthew 24, 34. Is Jesus talking about this generation or is he talking about some future generation? You tracking with me? Let's move on. Um, so the futurists, again, the dispensationalists, premillennialists, will look at this and say this is future. This has not happened this is in our future. Uh, the preterist looks at this like myself, and I believe that the portion that I read tonight happened in the first century. Let me walk you through now with the time we have left tonight um, why I believe that. The first one that we might say, okay, well, it says there's going to be false Christs and false prophets that arise. We see that in verse 5, verse 11. There's going to be false Christs and false prophets. We know from reading the book of Acts that that, in fact, is what happened. That there was many different false prophets. There were false messiahs that were raised up and who went and misled the people. We see this in the book of Acts, false teachers, false prophets. And we even see Josephus, who was a first century Jewish historian, who was an eyewitness to the destruction of the temple. He, his writings on the, the Jewish war between the Jews and, and Rome is extensive and detailed. He witnessed the siege of Jerusalem, the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. And he's an invaluable resource. It's not scripture. It shouldn't be held to as scripture. But it does give a lot of important historical context surrounding these things. And so Josephus records that there were false Christs that led people astray and even false prophecies that they made that led them into war with Rome. He says, quote, deceivers and imposters under the pretense of divine inspiration were fostering revolutionary changes. So false Christs, false prophets... We see that in the book of Acts. We see that from history. 
What about wars and rumors of wars? Every time that there's a war breaking out somewhere, especially in the Middle East, people start talking about, is, is it almost here? Is the end almost here? Et cetera, et cetera. Because of this passage, because here where Jesus says there, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and, and nations rising against nations. Could this be a sign that Jesus is about to return? We, we see wars and rumors of wars and there are some who say, all right, everything's going right on schedule. Here we go. Well, Jesus, when Jesus said these words, he was living under what was called at the time Pax Romana. Anybody ever heard of the, the Pax Romana? That's the Roman peace is what that means. It was a 200-year period of peace from 27 B.C., that's 27 years before Christ, to 100 A.D., this period of, of peace in the Roman Empire. It was a period of peace declared by Caesar Augustus that we were going to, in the Roman Empire, he declared, we're going to stop the conquering, we're going to stop, we're just going to have peace in the empire. We're going to learn to, to work together and live together. And it was an incredible time of peace for the most part, a peaceful time. And so when Jesus utters these words, he's living in a time of relative peace. But he says, in this time of peace, there's going to start to begin to be wars and rumors of wars. And that's exactly what happened. The Jews rebelled against Rome in 66 AD. They said, that's it, we're done with you. We're not living under Roman rule anymore. In 67 AD, Emperor Nero sends the Roman general Vaspian with four legions of troops. A legion was 6,000 troops, so 24,000 people. He laid siege to Rome. Nero was insane. He commits suicide. When Nero commits suicide, Vaspian goes back with the army to Rome, and Vaspian becomes the emperor. But he sends the general Titus to go finish the job that he started. And at this time when Caesar uh, Nero committed suicide, nations began to rise up and rebel. Britain, Germany, the, uh, the, the Gaul nations revolted for a short time against Rome. Wars and rumors of wars. And then as Vaspian, the new emperor, sends Titus to lay siege to Israel again, they convince the surrounding nations, Egypt, Syria, and Arabia, to turn against Israel. And so wars and rumors of wars, did it happen in the first century? Yes, it did. Absolutely it did. What's, what's interesting is that it was a time, for the most part, of peace, of relative peace in the world because of this Pax Romana. Leads us to famines and earthquakes. Anytime there's a major natural disaster, there's a kind of a group of Christians that say, these are the signs of the times. Well, were there famines and earthquakes in the first century? Again, as we read the book of Acts, we read there's a famine that broke out all around Jerusalem. And in fact, a big part of the New Testament is Paul raising relief offerings from the Gentile churches to send aid back to the Jewish church in Jerusalem that's suffering under this famine. Josephus also writes of the great famine in Jerusalem during the Jewish war in which many inside the city starved to death as they were laid siege and weren't allowed to go in or out. There was also a deadly earthquake that struck Jerusalem in 67 A.D. The historian Tacitus writes that during this period of time around the destruction of the temple that there were earthquakes in all the known world. Crete, Rome, Phrygia, Campania, Laodicea, Laodicea, Pompeii. There was, it was this incredible time of tumult from earthquakes and seismic activity. John Eliot in his Bible commentary says this, 
Perhaps no period in the world's history has ever been so marked by these convulsions as that which intervenes between the crucifixion and the destruction of Jerusalem. Remember, Jesus says not one stone will be left upon another. The disciples say, what, what'll be, what are the signs that we know that this is going to take place? And Jesus begins to give them the signs. There's also persecution in verses 9 and 10. Persecution. Again, read the book of Acts. I mean, the apostles and the early church believers are mercilessly persecuted. But in the book of Acts, it's not by the Romans that are persecuting them yet, although we know the, the church will be persecuted by Rome in the future. It's by the Jewish people that reject Christ. Now, not all the Jews reject Christ. There were many who received Jesus as the Messiah. But literally, almost every page in the book of Acts has the church being persecuted. Now, from, these are the ones that really are not very difficult to see. From that they, These were fulfilled in the first century. It, it's undisputable. False Christ, false prophets, wars, rumors of wars, nations rising against nations, famines, earthquakes, and persecution. We all see that that happened in history. It's the second half of this passage that gets a little bit more difficult. And this is where we have to really start looking at do we, what, what are we going to take literally and what are we going to take symbolically? Again, my principle is that we, I, I believe that 34, verse 34, this generation, I believe it demands, I believe 34, this generation demands we take that literally because he's using just natural language. And some of these others we interpret more symbolically. So the first one here, verse 14, let's look at that. This gospel, Jesus says, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So here the futurists will say, well, the gospel hasn't been proclaimed to all the nations. It hasn't gone to the whole world. Uh, therefore, the end hasn't come. The end of the, the Jesus was talking about here was not the end of the Jewish age, but Jesus was talking about the end of the world, and that has not yet come. That has not yet been fulfilled. The word that Jesus uses here for world, however, does not have to literally mean the entire planet Earth. And we see examples of this word being used in the book of Acts where they didn't mean the whole entire planet Earth. In fact, when they accuse Paul of, of stirring up trouble, they use the same exact word for world, okumene, the Greek word. And they say that Paul throughout the whole world is the ringleader of the Nazarenes and he's stirring up trouble in the whole world. Now, they didn't mean that Paul had traveled the seven seas and come to America and stirred up trouble over here. They were using that phrase like we use that phrase. And what we have to understand here is that, that Jesus here begins to use hyperbole. Just as he would say, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out. If your right hand offends you, cut it off. As I look around here tonight, I don't see anybody with an eye patch or a hook. Right? I, we understand language. We understand when somebody is using hyperbolic language. And so here I would argue that when Jesus is talking about the, the world, he's using it the same way that these opponents of Paul were using it, a very common way of using that word in that day. Paul himself even uses that word in Romans 1.8. He says, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Now here he doesn't mean again that they had sent missionaries to China or Zimbabwe. But simply this, what they meant is the known world. 
And so I believe here that Jesus is saying that before the end of the Jewish age, that will be brought to an end with the destruction of the temple in AD 70, that the gospel will be preached throughout the whole known world, which at that time was the Roman Empire. That's how I read that. This might be where you get off the train and say, nope, it has to go to every single nation and until that happens, th this has not been fulfilled yet. I just want to show you that there's a way to read this that I think is more natural in which Jesus is saying that the gospel must go to the known world and that Paul even says it that it has happened in Romans 1.8 that the faith of the gospel has gone and been proclaimed in all the world. That's an easy one. It gets harder. <laughs> the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation. Now, the futurist view has... Uh, let's look at it. Let's look at verse 15. Jesus says, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down and take what is in his house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back and take his cloak. The abomination of desolation, the futurist view is that uh, there's going to be a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And because it says that he has to stand in the holy place and there's not a temple in Jerusalem today. Therefore, a temple must be rebuilt and that there will be this figure, the Antichrist, who will stand up and do some sort of blasphemy inside that temple. That that will be the abomination of desolation. However, Matthew, we know Matthew's gospel is written primarily with a Jewish audience in mind. So when Jesus uh, says this, Matthew, writing to his Jewish audience, puts a parenthesis. Let the reader understand. Almost like, wink, wink. We know what he's talking about. Wink, wink. Okay? Luke, who writes about this exact same story, the exact same flow. We could be doing this from Luke chapter 21. Luke is writing not to Jews, but to Gentiles. And since Luke is writing to Gentiles, he just tells them what the abomination of desolation is. He doesn't do the parentheses, wink, wink. He tells them straight up, Luke chapter 21, verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that its desolation has come near. This is the abomination of desolation. This is the abomination that brings desolation. When the Jewish people were surrounded by the Roman armies. Now, do, do you remember how I said that... Um, Jerusalem was surrounded, was laid siege to, and then um, Nero died, and, and the general had to go back, and, and, and then he sent another general, and they, they surrounded the city again. Do you know that during that time, all of the Christians left Jerusalem because they had this passage? Because for a brief moment, there was a reprieve, and they were able to escape. And so every believer in Christ, all of the Christians vacated and they went to the surrounding areas and they got out of Jerusalem because they understood that when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Now once uh, the Roman armies breached the city, they then desecrated the temple. Josephus writes... And I quote, the Romans upon the flight of the seditions into the city and upon the burning of the holy house itself and of all the buildings lying around it brought their ensigns, that's their, their national flags, their, their idolatrous materials, into the temple. 
and set them over against the eastern gate. And there they did offer sacrifices to them. And there they did make Titus imperator with the greatest acclamations of joy. So the, the abomination of desolation, the temple was desecrated in the first century by Titus when he went in there and offered up these pagan sacrifices in the temple, in the holy place. And Luke tells us the abomination of desolation is the surrounding of Jerusalem by the Roman army. All right, it gets even harder if we want to keep going. Uh, what time is it? Goodness. Um, I'm trying to finish this tonight. This is just absurd. Um, I'll do one more at least, one more, one more. This, this is what you all came for. This is why you're here. Let's be honest. The great tribulation. This is what it's all about. This is the money maker. if you're writing end times books. The great tribulation. Verse 21, Jesus says, from then there will be, from then after the abomination of desolation, right, so... Let's, okay, let's start with the abomination of desolation, verse 15. Then he says, verse 16, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountaintops. Let those who are on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. Let the one who is in the field not turn back and take his cloak. But alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on Sabbath. Verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. The Great Tribulation. First, I need to show you that the Great Tribulation that Jesus is talking about is a local event. It is a local event. What Jesus is talking about here is not a world event wide outpouring of God's wrath. Because if it was a worldwide outpouring of God's wrath, why would it help to be able to run outside the city walls? Why would it help if I could just run to the hills or run to the next town? If it's a worldwide tribulation, you can't escape it. But Jesus here says, you can escape it. He says, don't, don't take your time, as my dad used to say, don't dilly-dally around. When you see these signs starting to take place, get out of Jerusalem, is what he's telling his followers to do. And that's what they did. But it's a local tribulation. It is not worldwide. Again, how could fleeing to the mountains of Judea help? If it's a worldwide event, it's local, it's contained to Jerusalem. So he's giving his disciples, again in the first century, warnings that they can act upon. But what about this statement that the great tribulation will be such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be? Is what Jesus say here, does this require this tribulation to be the worst time ever in human history? Well, I would ask, well, what about the flood? What about the flood? Is the great tribulation going to be worse than the flood? I mean, only eight people made it out of that. So whatever the great tribulation is, it's not going to be worse than the flood. I really believe that Jesus here is drawing on the language that they use in the Old Testament when they're pronouncing judgment. Hyperbolic, apocalyptic language, judgment language, often very over the top in its descriptions of catastrophe. Let me give you an example. 
This is during the Exodus when God's about to lead his people out of Israel. He says the, the, the death angel will bring throughout Egypt a great cry in the land such as there never has been nor ever will be again. So which is it? Which is the worst judgment? The judgment on Egypt or the judgment on Jerusalem? Well, look at what he says in Ezekiel 5.9. This is, this is the prophecy God made before Solomon's temple was destroyed. Before Solomon's temple. That's not the temple we're talking about now, Herod's temple. That's a rebuilt temple. But this prophecy in Ezekiel 5.9 is before the destruction of Solomon's temple. And he says, because of all of your abominations, I will do with you what I have never yet done and the like of which I will never do again. Except in Matthew 24, he's about to do it again. And this is simply because in prophetic writing, you have this over-the-top use of judgment language and it's not meant to be taken hyper-literally. Jesus is simply saying, it's just going to be bad. Guys, it's going to be really, really bad. And we understand this. We talk like this all the time. I was driving down the road the other day with Heather. We were driving in the car, driving down Hebner Road. And we saw this construction crew. They were working on this really tall antenna. I was watching this, this construction crew working on this antenna. It was a big mess, all this stuff going around. And I had never noticed this antenna before. And I was sitting there wondering, have I never noticed this antenna because there hasn't been a construction crew? Or did they just put it up? And so I'm sitting there pondering this. I'm sitting there meditating on this. Heather sees it, and she asks the question. She says, has that antenna always been there? To which I replied, I don't think it was there during Noah's flood. <laughs> so, and, and of course she, you know, <sighs> you know what I meant. We use language like that all the time. I knew exactly what she meant. Of course I knew what she meant. I was just being a hyper-literalist. I was just drawing back on my dispensational roots. You know, we're going to take all this very literally. I, I, I really think that here Jesus is not saying that there won't ever be periods of tribulation. There, there's been seasons of great tribulation. You look at the suffering of World War I and World War II. I think what Jesus is saying here is simply that it's going to be very bad before the destruction of Jerusalem. If you can get out, get out. Here are the signs. And when you read the historical accounts of what happened during those sieges, it, it was horrific. It truly was a great tribulation. The next two I have are on cosmic collapse, Christ coming on the clouds. I just, I don't... Okay, I, I feel like I need to bless you and let you go tonight. Um, the, well, yeah, we'll stop here tonight. Um, so, in, in, again, I, I hold a lot of, uh, many of my heroes uh, my grandparents, who I, who I have the utmost honor and respect for. Uh, my grandma, Belle, who taught me the Bible. She held to a futurist view of this passage. And in, in no way am I wanting to dishonor her or the legacy of this church or, or anything like that. That's, that's truly not my heart. But I, I do believe we... I, what, what I have come to see is I have been very compelled by the statement, this generation. And it, it's, it's hard for me to now wiggle out of that, having seen how it is used consistently throughout uh, Matthew's gospel. And so 
uh, for me, at this point in my life, I'm not anticipating or looking forward to a, a great tribulation of seven years. I, I believe what Jesus prophesied took place. And we'll, we'll, I'll show you, we'll see more when we get to the book of Revelation. Uh, but in my view, the premillennial uh, perspective gets this wrong because it puts the great tribulation at the end of church history when Jesus, I believe, says it happened at the beginning of church history. This does not mean that the church will not go through trials. This does not mean that the church will not face tribulation. It does not mean that we might not... It's, it's very possible, I believe, that we could endure persecution in this country. So I, don't hear me say something I'm not saying. But I am saying that what Jesus was talking about here was fulfilled. I don't believe that Jesus has already returned. I am looking forward, like all of us are, to Jesus' second coming and his return. But I do believe that he did come in judgment. He brought judgment in A.D. 70 on Jerusalem and on the temple, just as he said that he would in that generation. Now here tonight, there are three groups of people. And whatever group you're in, I love you. I feel honored to be your pastor. The first group of people, you're, you're praying for my soul right now because you, <laughs> you wonder if I'm turning into a liberal. And... I can assure you that that's not the case. But you, you, have not, you have not found anything that I shared here tonight compelling whatsoever. You think it's the biggest load of hogwash you've ever heard. That's the first group of people. The second group of people here tonight, you're like, that's, that's some interesting things. I've never heard of that before. I've never thought about it that way before. I, I find some of these interpretations compelling. I'm going to continue to... to read and I have, an, I have a, um, a, a, you've piqued my interest. That's the second group of people. The third group of people are just like, what in the world did you just talk about for the last hour and a half? I have no idea. None of it made sense. That's the most confusing presentation on anything that I've ever sat through. Now, those are the three groups of people. But hear me. Though we might be divided in those ways, we're united on one thing, and that is that we're all ready to leave right now. We're all <laughs> ready for this to be over. And so I have managed to produce unity by teaching on eschatology because we're all ready to get out of here right now. Listen, your view of eschatology it does not in any way affect your calling. We're all called to be salt and we're all called to be light. It may affect your outlook, but it doesn't in the least bit change what we're called to do when we leave this place. When we wake up tomorrow morning, we are all called to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are united by our faith in Christ. And our faith is anchored to the one who governs sovereignly all of human history and will bring it to the predetermined end that he has decided. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you for uh, your word. I thank you for your people who have a desire to know it and to study it. I pray that you would continue to help us as we move forward throughout this series. More than anything, Lord, let our hope and our confidence in you grow and our faith and our love for one another and help us to all be salt and light as we go out from this place today. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you.